Assalamu alaikum everyone and good morning. And we would like to welcome you uh, on the second day of the Gulf Intervention Society. And in the first session, it's going to be a structural heart disease. Uh, I'm joined here by a very esteemed uh, panelist, uh, Dr. Wal Qashqari from Jeddah, uh, Dr. Mohammed Belghaith from Riyadh, and Dr. Ahmed Shaqi from uh, Kuwait as well. Uh, I'm very pleased and honored to be uh, with them. And uh, we'll start our first talk with uh, Dr. Uh, Faisal Goofy, uh, who's going to talk about predictors and management of stroke during TAVI or TAVR, depends if you are European or American. So, uh, thanks, uh, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thanks for the GIS for the invitation for uh, this great meeting. Uh, I'm going to talk over the next uh, 15 minutes about predictors of stroke. Probably in an interventional meeting, we are expected to see some techniques. Unfortunately, over the years, we have not gained any new techniques to prevent this dreaded complications. I have nothing to disclose in relation to this talk. Over the years, we have, to do, we have defined goals for transcatheter aortic valve intervention. And since uh, clinical, uh, st clinical start for TAVR, we have seen a clear and steady improvement in mortality. Uh, our goals has been around enhancing quality of life for older population, reduce hospital stay. What we have been battling with over the years is uh, five major complications. Stroke is one of them. Baravalvaro leak, we have clearly improved since the use of CT scan compared to imaging. Pacemaker, with improvement of technique, we were successful in bringing this complication lower. Vascular complication with improvement in technology of technique, also this complication came down. A mortality with patient selection, not necessarily with the device, has improved over the years. So I'm going to start with a clinical reality. This is a case of a 71-year-old female who was admitted to the hospital with syncope and had a brief cardiac arrest. She was resuscitated with no uh, neurological deficits. She only had history of diabetes, no coronary artery disease, no carotid disease, no history of atrial fibrillation. She does have severe AS. Her CT analysis did not support that she is in any intermediate or high risk uh, parameters for the procedure. In fact, low calcium score. She had a very successful procedure, uh, conscious sedation, uh, a, a balloon expandable valve. Immediately post, you get the phone call about patient is not recovering well from your anesthesia colleague. Uh, not used to uh, going down to IR. We took her down to the IR. And I, I used to joke to my IR colleague, why do you start with a contralateral injection? So he always say to me, well, this is because I want to show you the anatomy that you have never been familiar with. So uh, if you look at this picture, this is the right. And if you compare it, we have the beginning of a clot in the right MCA. The brain, uh, or what we call the door to, uh, to brain time, was actually, every, anybody guess, the patient was put in the table. General, uh, it was conscious sedation. She was sedated with propofol and whatever your anesthesia colleague give him or give her in this situation. And probably it could be 90 minutes or 120 minutes. The procedure was successful. He was able to withdraw a clot and we could see a good blush. Uh, everybody was happy. Uh, we went back to the floor. But the course after that was very unpredictable. You could see here she had massive edema that actually at some point was compressing uh, on the uh, other half of the brain. Luckily, we are seeing this very rarely, but it's a reality check uh, with the transcatheter aortic valve implantation. This patient was, was one of the unlucky ones that she was not able to leave the hospital. So as an operator, you start ask yourself, is it me or is it the patient? Uh, luckily, over the years, since 2018, we were able now to have a certain, or at least we speak the same language within the neurovascular complication. And we definitely need to familiarize ourselves with this because our TAVI outcome will be, will be benchmark according to this type of complications. Now, is it an operator problem? This has been nicely shown from the TBT registry. Beyond 20 cases, there has been no meaningful change in the outcome in terms of mortality, vascular complication, bleeding, or stroke. So definitely after 20 cases, uh, doing more cases did not necessarily 
change this complication. Now, when is our stroke usually happening? Unfortunately, it's most of the time pretty procedure in almost 70% of the cases and within the, 70, the first 72 hours. And that's where I think investment in technique probably or newer technology should be uh, done over the next couple of years. Now, luckily, if you look at major trials over the years, we definitely the stroke risk has changed from 5% in the first trial to 1.7% in the most recent Evolute Pro trial. But you have to keep in mind what has changed is not necessarily the technology. The profile may be changed. It's actually the patient profile that has changed. Now, if you look at other source of information or other data, specifically the control arm of the cerebral protection device, we are seeing totally different number of incidents of stroke, ranging from 9.1% up to 27%. So again, we are facing a problem of definition and adjudication of this uh, major complication. Now, over the years, uh, when you look at the TVT registry, we were, or they were able nicely to the, change the risk profile of the patient, which clearly correspond to a reduction in mortality. But if you look into the stroke prevalent uh, incidence over the year, hasn't changed dramatically, although the technology in terms of profile changed significantly from 2015 onward. So you do not see a major change in the stroke. Now, if we look deeper or if we look using imaging, we will, we will all be surprised by how much we cause in terms of uh, brain or new lesions using MRI. And in some studies, almost 80% of the patients post TAVR uh, had new diffusion imaging uh, lesion, and we do not know yet the effect of such lesion on cognition. So basically, if we are moving forwards with a low-risk profile patient, we really need to have a strategy on how to handle this over the long term and whether or not it will affect the neurocognition. If you had a stroke, post taver you're clearly going to struggle. Your hospital mortality is going to be tripled between two, from 2.8% to 12.7%. You're unlikely to go home. You're most likely uh, going to go to a nursing home. And if you are still within the workforce, most likely 56% of the patient will not be able to go back to work. Now, we all, we, as an operator, we always also ask, what can we change or what has changed that will hopefully reduce our stroke risk? And to, to our surprise, when this publication came out, specifically almost uh, 11,000 patients uh, looking at patients who had a stroke versus patients who had not stroke. And the question was, does anticoagulation, specific anticoagulation regimen, help with the reduction of stroke. Within this trial, the incidence was comparable to the previous one, 2.3 to 2.4%. But if you look at the right of the screen, whether you were in DAPT, whether you were an anticoagulation versus not, and whether you were also in another analysis, transabical versus transfemoral, your risk of stroke hasn't changed. So anticoagulation itself did not necessarily your risk of stroke. So clearly stroke alter your TAVI procedure, can we predict it? And this is, I think, very helpful for us to counsel the family and to plan a procedure. Over the years, we accumulated wealth of data to specifically address predictors for stroke. This is, again, uh, a trials of more than 80,000 patients. They looked at 80,000 publication. They tried to lump some using a, a, a risk score. Uh, what are the predictors? Uh, being a female, increase your risk of stroke, chronic kidney disease. Uh, if you are in the first half of your experience with TAVI versus the second half, and if you have previous uh, atrial fibrillation, other predictors in this specific cohort was balloon expandable versus self-expandable, whether you both dilate or not. Now, recently, we have been seeing uh, uh, what we call a risk score. This becomes very valid and very helpful in terms of defining strategies. It might alter your techniques. I have to say I will stress and might, uh, because so far we have not seen any specific technique that address uh, reduction of stroke. This is called the task risk score. Almost from 8,000 patients who had TAVR, they generate a validation score, and they came up with uh, 
very dichotomized risk score from very low, low risk intermediate into high, depending on the points, peripheral vascular disease, chronic kidney disease, non-balloon expandable valve, and history of previous stroke. Clearly, if you calculate or if you accumulate more points, your prediction of stroke is go going higher. I found this very helpful when you really counsel the family. So you could see it coming from a while away. You could predict it. Can you do anything about it? And that's where we honestly, uh, we, we were a bit disappointed. Uh, when the cerebral uh, protection device came out, we were all, all having high hope. Uh, clearly, the technology works. You have captured debris in almost all the cases. Uh, the device is very safe. But uh, it, when you tested against this control, unfortunately, we did not find the benefit. Now, what are we capturing? And again, this comes to back to the mechanism of stroke. We are talking about debris, fibrin, any, any, any tissue products, but in fact, calcium and valve tissue has been less captured in those devices. So the majority is actually thrombi formed during the procedure. Within this same cohort, which was almost 80 patients, uh, having the valve type uh, was one of the predictors for stroke, so as both dilatation. So then recently, we, we, we had the news about the, prote uh, the PROTECT trial, which was a very contemporary trial that specifically addressing whether or not cerebral protection device can prevent stroke. Very neat device, symbol, 3,000 patients divided uh, uh, into two arms, cerebral protection versus not. Uh, no imaging part published so far. Uh, adjudication by neurology within 72 hours. Uh, whatever happened, either discharge or 72 hours, stroke within this time span, and the groups was very equal, uh, specifically balloon expandable were the majority, non-balloon expandable were actually a third, uh, still there is almost 40% pre-dilatation. Uh, small number of bicuspid valve and valve and valve, some might say you cannot draw conclusion in those two cohorts, specifically bicuspid and bioprosthetic valve. Uh, uh, female six were slightly different, but overall very balanced across all the risk group. Unfortunately, there is no difference between cerebral protection device versus not a hint of a difference in disabling stroke, which was not the primary endpoint. The conclusion of the uh, investigator was this study was specifically not powered to have a treatment difference within disabling stroke. And the most important conclusion is that which we were looking for is we could not generate any subgroup analysis to help us decide which or which group of patients uh, this device will work. What we are waiting, we are waiting the British Heart Foundation Protect Private Trial should be published around 2026, 7,000 patients, no much difference in terms of the primary outcome. And so far, we do not know if they're going to do an imaging substudy of this one. So this still might be hope for cerebral protection device. I think I have three minutes in my time. Okay, can, can we yes. give one minute? Because we did not start at nine o'clock exactly. So uh, thank you. Can I go to the next slide, please? Sure. Okay, so I think where, where should we invest or where we have maybe hope is actually in uh, acute intracerebral intervention. This is a very large cohort of patients which specifically looking at intra-procedural and immediate post-procedure uh, stroke. And basically they have an incidence of 2.3%. Within this cohort, they looked at patients who were treated conservatively versus people who we, they took down to the IR and they tried to either do thrombectomy or embolectomy. I just have to warn you this, the cohort itself is too small to draw a strong conclusion, but they classify the stroke into minor, moderate, or severe according to the NIH uh, score. Uh, almost more than two thirds of the patient treated conservatively irrespective of their stroke. Uh, 39 patients had uh, neuro intervention divided between mechanical thrombectomy versus thrombolytic therapy. And whether you are in the minor, moderate or severe range of stroke, patients who had neuro intervention fared better in terms of independence. But at one year, there was no difference between the two groups in terms of mortality, which again, uh, uh, 
big the question is whether the neuro intervention still early on can, can reduce the hospital stay and improve patient uh, dependence, independence. In terms of mortality, across all the group, there was no difference at one year, whether you were treated conservatively or with neuro intervention. Uh, Within the trial itself, uh, and again, I have to stress in the fact that the cohort was too small, uh, the patients who were either in minor or major stroke, patients who were more independent if they have neuro intervention. So that is something we might work in the future. So in summary, if we look uh, using MRI, we will be definitely surprised how much showering we cause with uh, TAVI. Uh, whether that will affect neurocognition in the future, we do not know. Stroke rate luckily decreased over time but became steady and maybe investment in uh, new intervention during the procedure, anticoagulation uh, might help in the future. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Faisal, for this uh, great presentation. Uh, we have time for a couple of questions or comment. So, Dr. Mohamed Belghaith, please. Thank you, Faisal. That's very good uh, overview. Um, I have a comment on the trial. I think the trial was well designed. It's a big number. This is the largest trial protected ever so far. Uh, after the announcement of the trial, I had a very high risk patient and I decided to use Sentinel. And when, I, when we retrieved what, wa what was on the filter, I was so happy because there was a big clot. That's one thing. H how do you think you can change your practice after this trial? Uh, I think we all, as an interventionist, hope that we have something to prevent stroke, but we do not, yet, we still have to believe the data. And this is, a, I have to say, a very well-conducted trial. Yes. The issue, though, is the definition of high risk, which patient is actually, that's where we need more refinement. We were hoping from this trial to come up with some predictors or some patients like the task risk score. Personally, still, I use the score to kind of define, the device is very easy to deploy, two to three minutes, but we have to remember there is cost and there is no data. So I'm still using it, and I have to say, very high risk patient. Yes. Okay. Dr. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Faisal. It's really very nice and thorough presentation. Uh, if you think the mechanism is really uh, embolization of tissue, which can be seen in, in, uh, on the MRI or on, on the filter itself. Why the filter does not prevent stroke? If we know the mechanism, how come there's no benefit from using the filter? Uh, excellent unless, question. unless there are other mechanisms causing the stroke yeah. that we don't know about. Uh, excellent question. I, I think there are multiple <laughs> things that we should concentrate on, but one of the things is actually the device. We do not know how much embolization air-wise happen also during deployment within the device, but also, uh, we, they, they looked at the particle size. The particle size, most of the debris is actually in the intermediate to large size. So I think there is more to it. Hyperfusion during the deployment can also contribute to the mechanism of stroke. But if we are investing in preventing the embolic type that actually can make a major change in the patient's life, I would have thought that embolic device should have worked. So honestly, after this trial, still we are struggling to define which patient that I'm going to reach out for a cerebral protection device. Uh, Dr. Atavi. Dr. Mohamed Atavi. Faisal. Thank you, Faisal, for this nice presentation. Now, the surgeons have the same incidents, and it doesn't seem that they are bothered by the risk of stroke. So I think we reached probably lower than the surgical colleagues when it comes to TAVR versus SAVR. Why, maybe the incidence is so low that you cannot reduce it any further. Now, what, what do you think? Is that like something we should work on hardly or what, whatever trial is there is enough to tell me or to tell us that this is the lowest we can go, uh, similar to surgeon, and that's enough? Uh, excellent, uh, again, comment and point. The surgical literature, first of all, lack the definition of the uh, clear outcome measure. But for us, for a low risk patient, still, maybe we are biased by the risk of stroke in PCI, which we are really talking about less than 1%. That's where we think you are right, we are plateaued, but can we do better? Maybe the anticoagulation, we still we have been using heparin, maybe the anticoagulation, new agents, maybe new techniques for cerebral protection. 
uh, that's something I think we have to look into the future. But definitely we have been plateaued and maybe we, we should accept that in the future, we'll, we'll see. Uh, Faisal, last question, and it's a very practical question. Cerebral protection device, for all or not? And if not, which patient you will use it for? Uh, I have to say, based on what we have seen so far, definitely not for all. Uh, I just show you by cuspid and valve and valve, we're a minority in this trial. So these are one I still reach out for a cerebral protection device. I think I, I personally would love to see the validation of this task score in relation to the cerebral protection device because I still use it for deciding if I'm going to reach out. If I have a very high risk patient with all the four predictors, I still reach out for a cerebral protection device till we get this trial, hopefully. Okay. Thank Great. you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent.